There is no quarter for an anti-war movement in the United States of America except for uh, on the right side of the aisle. I, I it's really, been confirmed by the retraction of this letter. No. Until Vladimir Zelensky personally decides the war should be over, it's a blank check to Ukraine. People won't stand for that. People aren't standing for it, and people are going to the Republican Party as a consequence. Everybody understands that this war has to end in a negotiated settlement. So why is it jab- so controversial for people to say that in a letter? That's what I'm getting at, because it's this method of doing it. This is in America's interest to promote these people and this struggle. I'm sorry, when I see someone like Matt I know you're making an the way that he has done. No, well, that, that is absolutely I mean, not I would true. Have Can I ask you, have you talked yeah. to Ukrainians about this? Yes. And then you go to the end of the letter and it says, this is, the, this is the primary aim of U.S. policy should be to end this war. It should it not be? Okay, I'm really glad to be joined today. We managed to, to squeeze this this interview in under the buzzer by Joe Serencione. He was on Bad Faith Podcast, uh, I think back in maybe May, talking yeah. about, again, the Ukraine war and the threat of nuclear proliferation. He's former president of the P- Plowshare Fund. He is an author. He is an activist. Welcome to the show, Joe. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Okay, so we all know why we're here today. We're here today to discuss what everybody's talking about. I feel like it requires like all caps, the all caps letter, the letter that has been roiling the left, the right, the center, everything in between. Let me set this up briefly. So earlier this week, feels like it was a lot longer ago than that, but earlier this week, the Congressional Progressive Caucus issued a letter dated October 24th. Um, that we're going to get back into in more detail. But broadly speaking, it reaffirmed Joe Biden's policy commitments to Ukraine, but raised the prospect of emphasizing negotiation. Um, Here's a brief segment. Uh, We are under no illusions regarding the difficulties involved in engaging Russia, given its outrageous and illegal invasion of Ukraine and its decision to make additional illegal annexations of Ukrainian territory. However, if there is a way to end the war while preserving a free and independent Ukraine, it is America's responsibility to pursue every diplomatic avenue to support such a solution that is acceptable to the people of Ukraine. Such a framework would presumably include incentives to end hostilities, including some form of sanctions relief, and bring together the international community to establish security guarantees for a free and independent Ukraine that are acceptable for all parties, particularly Ukrainians. The alternative to diplomacy is protracted war with both its attendant certainties and catastrophic and unknowable risks. Okay. Subsequently, the 30 members of the Congressional Progressive Caucus signed this letter. Subsequently, there was an uproar. Uh, People were very unhappy with it. They said it amounted to a letter that pushed for a capitulation to um, Russia, et cetera. As a consequence, The Congressional Progressive Caucus withdrew the letter Uh, the next day. I don't think it lasted more than 24 hours. Mm -hmm. The follow-up letter from Pramila Jayapal, head of the CPC, obviously um, said the Congressional Progressive Caucus hereby withdraws its recent letter to the White House regarding Ukraine. The letter was drafted several months ago, but unfortunately was released by staff without vetting. As chair of the caucus, I accept responsibility for this. Because of the timing, our message is being conflated by some as being equivalent to the recent statements by Republican leader McCarthy threatening an end to aid to Ukraine if Republicans take over. The proximity of these statements created the unfortunate appearance that Democrats who have strongly and unanimously supported and voted for every package of military, strategic, and economic assistance to the Ukrainian people are somehow aligned with Republicans who seek to pull the plug on American support for President Zelensky and Ukrainian forces. You subsequently uh, wrote an article uh, that was cutely titled, like, What WTF is Up with Ukraine? Explaining why you thought the letter was a bad idea and the withdrawal was a good idea. Tell me why. Okay, so if all you know about the letter is the what you just said, I mean, what's wrong with that? And I think for many people that they would say, well, look, a Congressional Progressive Caucus, good, a diplomacy, good, and the war with Ukraine, good, stop the bloodshed, good. So this must be good. So people are complaining about this letter must be against diplomacy, against progressivism, against peace. But that's not what the frame is. That's not what's actually going on here. This particular letter was based on a a very outdated assessment of the war. It was written in June when the war did appear to be stalemated. 
And when Russia had recently made substantial conquests, in fact, there are phrases in the letter that refer to Russia's recent conquest of Ukrainian cities. That was true in May, but it's not in October. And where there's a stalemate in May, now Ukraine's on the offensive. Russia's in retreat. So the situation of the war is quite, quite different. But then what real, so number one, it's based on a faulty analysis. So you would think that that would raise some flags for people. Number two, the proposal that it raises isn't just for diplomacy. It's for a very specific kind of diplomacy. They want the United States to engage in direct talks with Russia. Now, while it's good for the U.S. to have channels of communications open with Russia, and we are, in fact, talking to Russia now, it's just in the last couple of weeks, there's been three or four very high-level exchanges with Russia. What this letter calls for is direct negotiations for the purpose of seeking a ceasefire, right, and negotiating a peace. And that's what it says for, in the very end of the letter, repeats it, engage in direct talks with Russia. And there's a caveat there that says, you know, with the approval of Ukraine, but Ukraine is relegated to a secondary position. So normally wars end when the belligerents negotiate. So in this case, Russia, the invader, Ukraine, the defender. And what this letter does is it wants the U.S. to do this. Then the uproar. The uproar came from the signers of the letter, the people who were blindsided by this. This was just on a whole other level, just terrible staff work. I used to work on Congress for 10 years. And man, if you're doing a dear colleague, that morning you're telling your member, here's the dear colleague, it's going out, here's the talking points on it, or here's the press release. And, and they did none of that for these members. Apparently one, maybe two or three of the leadership was told about this. It's unclear if um, the great progressive leader, Representative Jayapal, was actually told this letter was going out or Ro Khanna was told it was going out. It's not clear. Um, they, she issued a statement that said the staff released this without proper vetting. But it was the members themselves who had signed it who then raised the outroar. And you saw people tweeting about it. One of them, Representative Jacobs, says, you know, I, I, this shouldn't have gone out. I, if I was presented with it today, I wouldn't have signed it. Why? Because it doesn't accurately reflect the situation on the ground today. It's somewhere this letter is like frozen in time. So they objected. People after people issued, the signers issued statements, taking their name off it and didn't urge Jayapal to withdraw it. The leadership of the House was quite upset with this. So it was the, in the Democratic Party them, themselves that they objected to this. And that's what caused the withdrawal. I was particularly struck by Jamie Raskin's uh, eloquent response to this. One of the signers and one of the people I was surprised to see on this letter, repudiating the letter. And he calls it, uh, this particular negotiating style, a colonialist reflex, that some people think that, that wars are settled by great powers and great powers alone. And even some of us in the progressive movement are infected this, with this view. It is a colonialist reflex. So that's what caused the, 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 the demise of the letter, a letter that was drafted by a very small group of people representing a particular view of what diplomacy should be, but not reflected of the, the wider progressive consensus on, on diplomacy and how to end this war. But go right, ahead, so go let's, at let's it. Let's start. There's a lot <laughs> there and I've been taking notes. So let's go. let's take on this uh, charge brought up midway and also at the end there that this is a, a letter that is urging a kind of colonial adventure that disregards the mm. um, autonomy and uh, of Ukraine and Ukrainians. You pointed to some section at the end of the letter, right. which you were you were referencing to make that point. And I want you to tell me where that was, because when I glanced at the end of the letter, here's what I read. We agree with the administration's perspective that it is not America's place to pressure Ukraine's government regarding sovereign decisions. And with the principle you have enunciated that there should be nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. That's a quote from Biden, I believe. Yeah. But as legislators responsible for the expenditure of tens of billions of U.S. taxpayer dollars and military assistance in the conflict, we believe such involvement in this war also creates a responsibility for the United States to seriously exp explore all possible avenues, including direct engagement with Russia, to reduce harm and support Ukraine in achieving a, pe in achieving a peaceful settlement. Mm -hmm. So help me understand why yeah. it is that billions of dollars of investment by America 
is not considered to be a colonial intervention or a no. the, the of a large powers trying to influence an outcome in a conflict huh. that is separate and apart from our own. But conditioning that money not on not not a not a claim to withdraw the money, not a threat to do anything to stem the money. Frankly, in this letter, but simply a, a conversation about wanting to facilitate negotiations instead of doing what the State Department has articulated, which is being willing to fight this with a blank check to the very last Ukrainian, apparently, despite the obvious military advantages of Russia as a nuclear power, which is what we were talking about last time you were on the show. Why is giving the money uh, not uh, about giving giving them billions of dollars of money, uh, not interfering with Ukrainian independence, but conditioning that money on having peace negotiations, uh, an imperial endeavor or colonial uh -huh. endeavor? Right. So maybe it's helpful to think about it this way. France helped the American revolutionaries with money, troops, strategy, blockades in our war of independence against Britain. <clears throat> and that would give them a certain sort of buy in or right to our revolution. But if they had come to Alexander Hamilton and George Washington and said, we're now going to negotiate an end to your revolution, we're going to negotiate directly with England, we would be outraged. But that's implied, and I believe explicitly stated in this letter, that's the part that's objectionable. And it's in the last paragraph that says we should, in conclusion, we urge you to, among other things, engage in direct talks with Russia. Well, and, it's, and it that's, says, in and that's what Jamie, go ahead. I, I can read it for you. In conclusion, we urge you to make vigorous diplomatic efforts in support of a Board negotiated of settlement and ceasefire, engage in direct talks with Russia, Explore prospects for a new European security arrangement applicable to all parties that will allow for a sovereign and independent Ukraine. And in coordination with our Ukrainian partners, seek a rapid end to the conflict and reiterate this goal as a chief, America's chief priority. So help me understand then, Joe, because earlier you mentioned, rightly so, that there are open diplomatic channels. Um, Lord, Lloyd Austin just spoke with his counterpart in Russia. And the critique has been that it shouldn't only be um, the Defense Department having direct negotiations with Russia. There should be diplomatic negotiations with Russia. So the fact that they're being open channels seems to, you know, undermine the idea that the channels are in fact the issue. Right. Let's do two things here. One, sure. uh, let, let me go back to that first paragraph you quoted where you said we they agree with the administration's perspective Mm -hmm. that it's not America's place to pressure Ukraine's government. Interesting point. Perspective rather than position. But then <laughs> they state that. And then the second sentence produces that wonderful word, but, that, <laughs> that then says, but we have this special responsibility because we're paying for this, right? And there's a certain logic to that. That's not untrue. But the two things are not connected. So the first sentence does not condition the second sentence. And as a result, what this what it, what you see in this letter is that Ukraine's um, uh, prerogatives are recognized, but they're placed in a subordinate position. They're secondary. That is, the U.S. will have direct talks with Russia and arrive at some kind of agreement towards a ceasefire and whatever a new European security arrangement is supposed to be. And then they will get the approval of Ukraine. So it does say we're not going to do this without Ukrainian approval. That's true. But they're then placed in a secondary position. That's what Jamie Raskin is talking about when well, he calls this a colonialist yeah. reflex, that we're the great power. How can we understand this, though, Joe? Yeah. Because there's a world where someone says, you know what? This is none of our business. We shouldn't be influencing what happens in Ukraine. And yes. therefore, we're not going to give them $80 billion and they can work out this conflict on our own, on their own. Why yeah. on earth? is the United States of America, a country thousands of miles away with no relationship to uh -huh. Ukraine, which is not a NATO country. Why should it be involved in this in this conflict at all? The problem is, Joe, the willingness to accept the money. You're, you're, let's take your analogy. If we are accepting money from France and France wants us to do something, negotiate a certain outcome to the Revolutionary War, et cetera, and we don't want to do it, we can easily say, mm -hmm. all right, the choices are to, and again, this is not even what the letter right. contemplates. Right. The, the letter does not threaten any withdrawal of funds. But the vaguest suggestion that the people who are funding this war in large part should want to make sure that the war is coming to the quickest conclusion possible, and that is there's not an expectation that there's a limitless spigot of funding for them to continue to 
have a fight that they cannot win strategically all out and all out war warfare because of the asymmetry between the powers of these two countries. Why shouldn't it be the case that America makes it clear that there is going to be some end to the funding and that negotiations, good faith negotiations should be a part of the active um, uh, goal here? Yeah. Well, there are, of course, limits on our our um, funding and our in involvement with Ukraine. And the president has made this very clear. And I think Biden deserves a lot of credit for giving enormous aid to Ukraine, but not doing anything that escalates the conflict. And that's why he's putting limits on the kinds of weapons that Ukraine gets, particularly the range of these weapons. He doesn't want Ukraine to be hitting targets in Russia, which has the possibility of es escalating the war. We're not committing U.S. troops to this, which, of course, would then make this a direct conflict. We're not giving them the fighter aircraft or the modern battle tanks that they want. So Biden's trying to do what we, we would call escalation control, support them, help them repel this illegal, brutal invasion and occupation, free their people from Russian occupation, but not escalate the war, not push Putin in such a way that he might, and this is the big fear, and of course it's reflected in this letter, that he might use nuclear weapons as he has repeatedly threatened to do. So yes, there are limits, and we have national security interests in this. What you're reflecting, I think, is the view of some people, and some of the people who were involved in promoting this letter and helping to draft it, do believe that we have no business being in Ukraine, that we shouldn't be there. So um, why? what is the rationale? Because this is the question that I asked Matt Dess immediately when the conflict emerged. What is the articulated rationale for America being involved in this conflict and spending $80 billion plus dollars on this conflict where that same money, dollar for dollar, if, if it was just about saving lives, mm -hmm. how much money can America d give to the cause of keeping people alive and ending human suffering around the world? You could cherry pick any number of th ways to get engaged that also do not involve military engagement as opposed to humanitarian engagement. So what is the articulated rationale for okay. why Ukraine? I would give you three. And the first is sort of the geopolitical global order argument. You cannot allow a nation by force to change the boundaries of Europe. We haven't seen that since the end of World War II. And, and that's what Putin is doing. He's of, saying of Europe he, specifically, other well, countries can invade each other's borders? No, we, we could go further. I mean, this is why the, the U.S. intervened when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in 1991. Same principle. You can't allow borders to be changed. Europe is particularly important to us because it's it's our, the core of our national security alliance system. It's it's our biggest partner in the world. But, 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 yet, but that's and, true and for yet everybody. Ukraine, but, and yet Ukraine is not actually a country that's involved in any mutualistic you know, right. defensive relationship. Exactly. They're not part of NATO. We don't have a defense relationship. But then we have some, some security assurances we gave them when they, we helped them get rid of the nuclear weapons they inherited from the Soviet Union. So that's part of an assurance there. But no, they're not part. But no, but we don't have a formal defense relationship with them. But when they're in, invaded, no, that's not. So that's 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 the big thing. I mean, that's what motivates most of the uh, national support, particularly in the West. You don't want because if you get Ukraine, what's next? And believe me, the Baltic nations are, who are actually share a border with Russia are looking at that. It's why Finland just joined NATO, why Sweden ended 200 years of neutrality and joined. They are well, worried about. And so we looked at, Joe, you might not a, be worried, that's a, that's but a, they that's are That's a worried. chicken and the egg situation okay. because some people would argue that the Russian invasion is triggered in part by the large, significant expansion of NATO after a time when there were commitments made that this is a defensive treaty in response to the USSR, which no longer exists, but for some reason keeps getting closer and closer to Russia's border, despite assurances from the West right. that that would not happen. Right. And I was a critic of NATO expansion in the 1990s and then 2008 when they announced further expansion. Uh, and so and many of the people who helped draft or write this letter um, have that view. That the what that exactly what you said. The West basically caused this war by provoking Putin. And well, look, it's 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 not just that's not a, to diminish Putin's ultimate responsibility in this. Right. But but this is the issue. There were people calling before the war started to stop basically thumbing your nose and and putting out these provocative statements about Ukraine being allowed to join NATO and the other uh, countries that have joined NATO as well. And, said, and warned, warned that this was going to happen. And so it's not that Russia isn't responsible for its own actions, but at what point is the 
uh, international community that poked the bear, as it were, how much can they be even trusted at this stage to actually push for negotiations when it seems like what they were doing for was pushing nah. for some kind of escalation right. in the first place? Well, just to answer that one, you can trust negotiations because everybody understands, everybody, that this war has to end in a negotiated settlement. That that's how wars usually end unless you right? you, 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 you so bring in the So why is it jab. so controversial for people because to say that in a lot? That's what I'm getting at because it's this method of doing it that when we're, what most people are talking about is Ukraine and Russia, with the assistance of outside countries, have to negotiate the deal themselves. That's the only way it works. And we have lots of countries who are offering their help, France, Turkey, others who are trying to intervene on this to get Putin. But here's the other reality. Neither Ukraine nor Russia want to negotiate right now. So how exactly do you do this? And so their solution is the way you do this is you go over the Ukrainian head. So if you think that we shouldn't have been in this war in the first place, that we basically provoked this war, it's terrible. It's put us, but we don't have vital national security interests. The Ukrainians don't want to negotiate. How do we do this? The U.S. should move in and cut a deal. That's the great power. Well, well let's let's talk the about the negotiation to aspect of this, but, because many people are concerned that, you know, it was reported that back in, I believe it was May, I'm reading from Common Dreams now, Boris Johnson pressured Zelensky to ditch, to ditch peace talks with Russia. This There have been multiple oh, yeah. statements from the State Department, um, one from Lloyd Austin that I just clicked away from. I'm trying to find it again. OK, uh, saying around the similar time that following his visit to Ukraine uh, with Anthony Blinken, said that he wanted to, quote, to see Russia weakened to the degree yes. that it can't do the kinds of things that it has done in yes. invading Ukraine. There have been many statements made at this yes. point about wanting to basically do regime change in Russia, which yeah. you can feel yeah. however you want to feel about Putin. I don't think that anybody here is going to be baking him a birthday cake anytime soon. But the reality is that seems to be the colonial effort from many people's perspective and why there are so many people who feel like they don't have a political home now and are moving to the right where there is some... Crit cr criticism of this approach, uh -huh. wanting just to, there to be some kind of affirmation from the left that endless wars are not okay, and funding Ukraine not so that it can regain its territories and have peace, but so that it can weaken Russia is not a goal that American and the American left in particular should be participating in. I completely agree. That is exactly right. And I believe that that's, I understand the statements you're saying, but when you look at U.S. policy, that's not what we're doing. We have we have been very careful not to well with one slip of President Biden not to imply that that we're after this is a regime change war because in the end a slip you, you know he, 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 he put it at the end of his speech how is this man going why is this man in, remaining I, in power I, I know, you know but I, I'm 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 pushing back at the I, whether it's I understand but look at what we're doing just look at to to I mean, we're not a slip. You've we're got the you've got the Secretary not, of State and the, the and the Secretary of Defense and the President of the United States all in concert saying that this is a regime change operation and we're supposed to no, see that as, they're not as a saying as a that. I, I gotta hold you back. They're not saying that. We can Russia so? and how can this man stay in power are our, our, our statements, but this is there is no indication whatsoever that the US has a plan or is trying to or is so advocating why not regime change. Say that? Why well, not that's a very good point. Letter to be said. So, uh, but you have to. OK, so several things. Number one, you can't you shouldn't conflate diplomacy and diplomatic efforts with this letter. There are lots of people working on diplomacy. I'm telling you, this is a very particular point of view from a very particular set of small groups that were pushing this and it blew up in their face. They were making a run for influencing the Congressional Progressive Caucus and helping to determine their foreign I, policy. I, I, I and it exploded. Let, let's talk about this idea because it's come up now a couple of times that there are small groups here. The backdrop of this conversation is that there is actually a very large percentage of Americans, including yeah. many people who do, do not at all identify as Republicans, who are very frustrated when they see these aid packages going out the door with seemingly no obstruction or no problem to a country that most Americans can't find on a map. At the same time that we've just been told for two years, we can't have a child tax credit, we have to end extended unemployment no. benefits, we can't get um, you know comprehensive, uh, any kind of real comprehensive uh Healthcare relief, you know, Biden is crowing about uh, lowering Medicare prices for the elderly, and that's great for the elderly. But what about for the rest of us? I mean, this is the world that we're living in: high right. inflation rates, et cetera. But somehow, the bills that are so easily passed are these ones to fight this country on the other side of the world. Combined with the statements that I've read, and we disagree about how to characterize them, 
about how the plan seems to be not necessarily aimed at shortening the conflict, but weakening Russia. People across the board, large groups of people are PO'd. So the question, and so, so much so, by the way, and we should play this clip, so much so that even very moderate establishment institutions like Pod Save America, even there you're having I heard conversations Biden being had. You make the, the right point that when, what Biden's saying is I won't negotiate around the, the settlement that Ukraine has to accept without them. That doesn't mean we don't have things to talk to the Russians about. It just right. means Biden's not going to sit there and say, well, maybe you can keep this part of Ukraine and not that part of Ukraine. That's not going to happen. But to your point, if you don't create any space for kind of debate in the center here around this policy, you know where all the concerns about the war are going to go? They're going to go to where Kevin McCarthy took it, right? totally. which is it like, hey, I'm getting uncomfortable here. There's nuclear threats. Let's cut off the Ukrainians, right? It's a lot of money. So, yep. uh, you know, to some of you, like some of the Ukraine stands on, on Twitter or whatever who like just, you know, pile on this stuff, you may might be creating the outcome you don't want because by to, punishing yes, anybody yes. who says, let's have diplomacy, the only alternative to your position, you know, is where Kevin McCarthy's going, which is like, hey, let's cut these, where Tucker Carlson is. Basically. Or, yeah, where Elon Musk. I mean, there's yeah. clearly a void of people. There's a void of And, like, discussion. Elon Musk yeah. is filling it. Or that guy David Sachs, some, like, idiot tech investor, <laughs> yeah. right-wing goober is filling it. You know, it's yeah. like, yeah. why don't we have the CPC, the Congress, uh, the, the progressive in the House fill it? Yeah. Or at least try. Well, th that would be a very healthy place to fill it. Yeah. I heard him on Wednesday. I wrote to him immediately. We have an exchange. I think he's wrong. But I understand. But he has a point. What you were saying is, look, the, 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 the uproar of this letter shrinks the space for diplomacy. And that is, that is unfortunate. And what these guys did really screwed up efforts to get real diplomacy. I mean, they messed this up. And it's true. This is going to be it's going to make it more difficult to advance other more practical. Why? Wait, how, how is this the fault? Help me understand. How is this the fault of people who, who people who wrote a letter that yeah. I feel like look, substantively you're still saying you agree no, with? No, no, no. I do not agree to... with this letter. You're saying that okay, this letter so... represents diplomacy. If you're against this letter, you're a warmonger. And believe me, I can't tell you how well, many people well, have said my, that on those... Twitter. Those are I my know. words exactly. I know those are. I know. But, but tell but me, help me understand, is, Joe. Where this, in the letter? This was where, terrible staff work, terrible analysis, terrible expert advice, not enough member oversight, and not to mention the release of it. You're criticizing, you're wanting your president of your own party to change a, the core of his national security strategy two days before an election. I mean, Joe, who Joe, does where, that? Where in this letter is there a, an argument for Joe Biden to change his approach to Ukraine? Because what I read was a lot it's, of... It's, it's, why would you send the letter if you don't want to change? What's the point of the letter because if you you're want, just complimenting him? Because you want Joe Biden to clarify what you've admitted here were inappropriate statements that give people no. the belief that he's into regime change. And you want him to open up space for a conversation on the left but that's about how not, obviously we're pushing for diplomacy. Obviously, let me, let me is the goal. just remind you that... Yeah. The members who wrote this letter, who signed it in June, objected to it being released. This is not a military industrial complex who stepped on it. The members themselves wanted the letter pulled back. You know, th that you got to well, remember this. That, look at all the statements that they issued. Mark Pocan, is he a warmonger? He, he came out and criticized this uh, immediately. Um, immediately. Sarah, uh, Representative Jacobs said, I would not have signed this letter today. Bo Khanna on CNN, who was defending the letter, said, no, it should not have been released. So you have to understand, this is not a fight between the forces of good and the warmongers who uh, want to continue the war. This is this was a very stupid letter. It was dumbly done. And the people who wrote this are being discredited within their own groupings. Nobody's going to touch these people, which is really the cra the catastrophe, because look at what the, ha the harm it's done to Jayapal, who's on a, a track to assume leadership. I, 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 I got to be honest, I don't give a fig what happens to Jayapal, because uh, I think that she's a disastrous leader, and her ooh, throwing her well, staff under fan. the bus is, 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 it also shows an integrity lapse that I'm not really wild with. I don't think you understand what the staff was doing here. We'll, we'll come they back. They deserve a lot of blame here. We'll come back to the staff issue, but I will say this. Having been in any kind of senior leadership position, I think it, it's very, very poor taste uh, and in okay. very poor form. But if your staff fails, it's because you fail to oversee them. Can we, can at we the get end back to day. why we should be supporting you? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, I'll wait. It's your we, show. We can't come back I'll to that, but I, I, I do want to come back. Since we're on the subject, I want yeah. to play the Ro Khanna clip. California Congressman Ro Khanna is one of the Democrats who signed that letter and is still backing it. Congressman, what in the world happened here? 
Let me tell you my position. I have voted for every package to arm Ukraine. I will continue to vote to arm Ukraine. But what happened with this? Well, the, signed the letter, didn't sign the letter, it was a staffer. How does this happen? I don't think the staff was to blame. I think the letter is common sense. We're going to stand with Ukraine, but at the same time, we're going to have diplomacy to try to end the war. You know who tweeted out that just today? Ambassador McFall, who is one of the strongest advocates for standing with Ukraine. You know, people need to look at the history. When we armed the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, did President Reagan stop talking to the Russians? Absolutely not. One of the reasons we got the withdrawal of the Russians is we continued to negotiate. When we had the height of the Cold War, did our senior military stop talking to the Russian military? Absolutely not. These people on Twitter, have they spoken to General Dunford? Because I have. Have they spoken to Admiral, Admiral Mullen? Have they spoken to the senior military leaders? They have no idea what they're talking about. I'm on the Armed Services Committee. Here's why fundamentally there is, I think, a real credibility issue when people say that, that oh, it was just a timing issue. No one. It's a staffing issue. It's administrative issue. Because here's the thing. People like Matt Duss, Bernie's former foreign policy advisor, the day the letter comes out, tweets, yeah. This is a good letter. Yes. Backs the administration's continuing support for Ukraine, urges more aggressive U.S. diplomatic effort to identify possible ceasefire options while making clear no agreement will be made without Ukraine. Yes. And then he and completely I had turns it around. About this. Yeah. Com completely turns it around the following day and says that this letter is a mistake. So for many people watching, right. it doesn't seem like it's an organic Oh, gosh, immediately, like this, this was timed wrongly and they should have updated this sentence and that sentence to more accurately reflect what's happening on the ground now in the region. But all in all, the sentiments are still on on uh, on good footing. What it feels like is that a call came down from on high and people were told to this was they were going to get in big trouble if they stood behind it. And then the scats, the rats went fleeing. T no. Tell me why I'm wrong. Have you talked to anybody on Capitol Hill about this? I, I, I have. Them? Okay. I people, have. The phone started ringing off the hook from the people who signed it. They were, you have to understand, this is the number one rule of staff. You do not blindside your member. And they were blindsided. They had no idea this thing was going on. They forgot about it. But now, is the objection, hey, I, can you edit? Can you reissue? This is what they could have done. They could have reissued a version well, of the tried. letter that that updated some of the, the stuff about the military status on the they ground. They could have, but they didn't. I mean, they, so they nobody didn't. saw it. Right. So so when they before they released this, all the staff felt that they had everybody sign off because they had signed it in June. And so they were ready to go. And they never brought it back to the members. No, no, no. Said, I, I'm saying after people objected. Oh, yes. Instead of issuing a retraction, right. they could have issued an updated letter well, that Jaya still Powell made the tried. point. So she issued a clarification on Monday morning and then another clarification on Monday right. afternoon. But it was clear you had to staunch the bleeding. I mean, this was it was it was a terrible message. And you can Stops see the bleeding. I'm, it made it worse, Joe. It made it worse because now because yeah, now there's confirmation well, I mean, there was, that the that the right and now the right is doing a victory lap that there is no quarter for an anti-war movement in the United States and America, except for uh, on the right side of the aisle. I, I it's really, been confirmed by the retraction of this letter. No, you see, that's what I mean. You're you're identifying these these this letter with the entire anti-war movement. Did the entire anti-war movement sign up on this? Did they agree to these terms? No. This is well, a no, big it, peace movement in the United States. No, no, no. You want a genuine the, peace. And no, this, there is. this is this is not a rejection of diplomacy, it's a rejection of dumb diplomacy. It's this no, is it's not the Democratic the way to get Party's it. repudiation no, of that anti-war no, movement. No, it is not at all. You, you, in fact, look, look at the front page of the Washington Post today, the day we're recording this. There's a big story about allies are now questioning American staying power on support for Ukraine. Why? Two reasons. One, the MAGA movement. The, they don't want to support this. The Republicans, you know, 53 Republicans voted against aid to Ukraine. Kevin McCarthy is saying if he's elected a House a speaker, you know, we're, we're going to reconsider all our aid to Ukraine. And then the other thing they cite is this letter and, this, and, the, and the effort by 30, only 30 members, to force a change. And they're saying fissures are opening up. And they're right. And this is true because the longer the war goes on and as the bills pay up, it is going to be more difficult to get Western support to maintain. And that's what Putin is counting on. Because this is what he this is why he doesn't want to negotiate now. He thinks he can he can crack 
Western support and Ukrainian support over a very rough winter. And he's been knocking out one third of their electrical supply. So they freeze over the winter and that he can outlast the West. That's what he's betting on. And the allies are a little worried about this. So this letter has done real damage to the to the united support that Ukraine has got. So, what, so why should we be supporting Ukraine at all? In yeah. addition to the the, the the security, the global security reason, of not wanting people to use force to change borders, there's a uh, there's a uh, a basic human rights reason. We do not abandon people who have been invaded by a fascist dictator, and that's what Putin is. We help them. We resist this. And here's finally the moral reason. Watch the new frontline show that takes us behind Ukrainian. Uh, uh, occupied cities that have been recently liberated. And look at what the Russians are doing in Ukraine. People often talk about occupied territory, but this is occupied people. They have tortured and slaughtered and raped and deported hundreds of thousands. 1.5 million have been forcibly deported. They're stealing Ukrainian children. 500 just so yesterday were shipped to Russia. And you and this is why we should be supporting them. We cannot allow this kind of evil to go unchecked just on a basic so moral reason. I mean, don't you agree with that? I, I'm sorry, I don't. And here's okay, why. why. Why? There are gangs that have overtaken Haiti. There is a cholera pandemic that was started by the U.N. U.N. members raped Haitians. A third of Pakistan was underwater. Should we go, due to, due to cl the climate crisis, should we go and invade China because Uyghurs are in concentration camps? Tell me, tell me, articulate. And this is the question that I asked Matt Dust when this war first started. Until you can articulate to me what the rationale is behind where America intervenes and where it doesn't, and give me some kind of moral accounting that makes me believe that it's actually about moral commitments and realizing how much of our money and our resources in the richest country in the world can go to saving lives and increasing the quality of life for the most people, as opposed to a a strategic military intervention mm -hmm. for territory resources and political control. If you can articulate to me why this is truly the most deserving humanitarian case on the planet, as opposed to a continuation under these Cold War policies, we want our economic system, our oppressive, by the way, economic system to maintain global dominance, then I can start to entertain a conversation about what our intervention should be, how long and how much. But there is nowhere in the entire public sphere that that conversation is actually happening and nowhere close to a rationalization that's been presented. Got it. Um, <clears throat> let me give you two sources to go to that say this much more articulately than I do. The first is uh, Jamie Raskin's letter, which I, I would like to print on parchment and hang on my wall because it is a wonder. I, I, I'm sure you, I don't know if you've read it. You're. No, yeah. I've read the excerpts on. on I know, what, but I haven't read it, in it, it. It talks about what re what Ukraine represents and the kind of society it's representing that's developing in the war, which is different from what Ukraine was before the war, and the inclusive nature of this, and then the kinds of people that are fighting this war and coming together for this war, and and what you and Ukraine is really a young, struggling democracy trying to stand up to an authoritarian, I would say, fascist power. And this, th th this is in America's interest to promote these people and this struggle. Timothy Snyder says something more elaborately in his Foreign Affairs article about the need for democracy to prevail over authoritarianism and a victory for a democratic Ukraine and a defeat for Putin would be a huge victory for freedom, for human rights in the world today. So it's not just about Ukraine, although that's the primary reason we should be aiding them. They're the ones getting killed, raped, deported and tortured. But it's also rep would be a, a tremendous advance for the cause of democracy, human rights, and freedom in the and world, which has been is. under pressure. That's has what been it is. The pressure. cause of democracy. The cause of democ democracy okay. has been the, ah, the excuse see. making for American imperialism. Look, when well, that I is, look I into agree it, with you. And that is a problem. We all, you know, we're defending our freedom by going to Vietnam, right. really? By going I, to uh, I, I, Iraq? I look at, you know, I understand. I look at, I Syrian children, but in this case, and it's true. Yemenis and Haitians and Pakistanis, and I see humanity in a in a just 
struggle in each of those phases. And I got to tell you, it does bother me. And I'm not saying you're doing this. But when we saw all of the footage in the beginning of the war where reporter after reporter couldn't keep themselves from gushing over how blue eyed and just like us, these people looked, that part of this does have to do with the fact that it's a European country and people feel like those lives matter more. And and they're able to justify the war on that basis. Now, I don't think that's why we're there. I think we're there because we don't care about people at all, but because of our strategic global dominance that we're trying to maintain at the end of this flailing empire. Right. But again, I'm not making an argument that there isn't a case to go to Ukraine. I'm just saying nobody's made the relativistic case that I think is necessary Uh. to justify intervening here and not in a million other meritorious places. Let me try this. Sure. So um, over the last 20 years, the U.S. has engaged in a series of unnecessary, counterproductive and disastrous wars uh, that, that have destabilized the Middle East, that have cost us thousands of our best warriors, that have killed about a million people. We think the Middle East wars have killed about a million people. That's much worse than what Putin is doing in Ukraine right now. These are terrible wars, and they were designed by people who wanted to expand American hegemony. This, the whole point of invading Iraq was to knock off an enemy and help establish, you know, from the, from the point of view of the architects of this war, a, a American dominance in the region for generations to come in preparation for war with China. I mean, that's what they thought. That's why they were doing this. And you and I probably agree on this. So a big movement has developed against that and on many, many levels of American society against that. And so when the Ukraine war comes up, a lot of people put that in the same frame. Oh, here we go again. Here we go again, intervening in somebody else's conflict. And I understand that. But this is different. This is not an American initiated war. We didn't go there. We didn't seek this war. Putin invaded not because he was provoked or felt threatened. Ukraine doesn't have a military threat against him. There were no troops massing on his border. He explained it all in speech after speech. He thinks of Ukraine doesn't have a right to exist. They're not a real nation. I, I'm they sorry, should can, be part I'm, of I'm, Russia. I need and so you when to they find go a, in, let me just finish this that. last. You can't find one quote for that? No, I said I need you to establish a quote for that because many people have mischaracterized a lot of his speeches and they've gone unchecked because they're in Russia. So we're being unfair to Putin? No, I well, yes, it is possible to be unfair <laughs> to a person you don't like. Well, you alert the presses. It okay, is completely let's, possible let's, to be fair, say- un- unfair to someone, even if I don't like them. So, yes, I, I need because I, I, I remember a lot of people were characterizing one particular speech okay. that he gave as this empire building speech. And then Russian speakers came up you right. know, a week after and actually listened to it and said, actually, that's not at all what he had said. So I just want to make sure we're we're dealing in truth. I'm not saying it's not true. I just want to make sure. Okay, let me just, here's one way to know we're dealing with the truth. He annexed the territories he's occupying. So he's doing what he said. Ukraine doesn't have a right to exist. He's made them part part of Russia. Wait, okay. These are lands that he invaded in two invasions, 2014 and then just this year. And now he made them part of Russia. So isn't that doing what he said? So wait, Ukraine doesn't have a right to exist I is not how I would put, and I'm not saying that, that I agree with this point of view, but the counter argument is that there has been a civil war going on in Ukraine. Oh, no, you don't buy that. That there has been a civil war going yes. on in Ukraine? I, I don't think that that's really disputable. That- you mean <laughs> after after Russia invaded in 2014 and armed these groups and, then, and made them the, sort of the, the, the territorial control of the, of the territory that they invaded, that civil war, that's what you mean? No, I mean that there was a Ukrainian speak, a historically Ukrainian spe- uh, speaking region of Ukraine in the east that has been in conflict with the other parts of Ukraine, that there has been weapons of fire exchange and deaths oh, that are okay. happening in that there, region for a long some, time. There's been some conflict, yeah. Yes, that's right. and that consequently there have been moves to, for example, delegitimize, de- derank Russian wow. as, a, as a language in the country. And all of these kinds of things that have made people have mixed feelings, at least before the invasion. I understand that the invasion has colored even the more Russian sympathetic parts of the country for obvious reasons, but that there was a real dispute here. And that part of the issue was that in um, that the, the Minsk Accord was supposed to be uh, a path to resolving some of the mm-hmm. inner Ukraine conflicts that was foiled in some respects by U.S. intervention and by the West. And as a consequence, that was part of the provocation, not a justification or legitima- legitimation, but part of the provocation that became the framework that Russia felt like justified its invasion. 
that it used as the pretext for its own invasion. And do you so, think it uh, justify the invasion? No, of course not. Nothing justifies an invasion. But if I know, if I see a big dumb drunk in a bar, I'm not saying I ask for it if he slugs me in the face, but I'll tell you what, I have a lot less sympathy for the person who went up with him, poke, 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 and told him his wife was ugly than the person who just walked out of the room, got in a cab, and went home. And so if we want things like this not to happen, I think that we have to be honest about the role that we played in these kinds of conflicts. Now, I, this is getting I, down I, a road. I, I, I agree. Go ahead and, so, and, and, and when this is over, we have to go look back at those policies and say, you know, why didn't we understand more of Russia's legitimate security concerns? And I, I, I got to tell you, I agree with this. I've, I've gone into great detail in other talk shows about how stupid it was to put missile interceptors in Poland and Romania, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. had no real purpose, but the Russians saw this. Yeah, we threat. talked about this. We, we did. And, I've, and, and, and I, so th that was dumb. And I talked about, I argued against it when I was on the State Department Advisory Board, and I argued about it with officials, couldn't budge them. They were wrong. That was a mistake. We did make mistakes. And NATO expansion was not done right. And we should have done more on the, the, the what we call the U.S.-Russia partnership. We did make mistakes. And, was all, and that was part of our sort of post-Cold War hubris that we were the only guys in town and we could just roll right through it. We didn't really have to pay attention to Russia and, and not to mention the economic vice we gave Russia, which was terrible, which led to the rise of these oligarchs, et cetera. So lots of mistakes. I am a lifelong critic of U.S. foreign policy. I, I just know, Joe. That's why everybody, than, that's why people are so sad and confused about how people that we've trusted who are so part of this Bernie world, et cetera, how there can be this breakdown. This there day. are things worse than American foreign policy. And that's what I mean by the shift. There is some, there are worse things out there and Putin is one of them. This is, you do not want to live in Russia. How would you feel if you were Brittany Griner right now? You do not want to be in a system where there are no rules, there are no human rights, where one person Joe, controls everything. There that are way a, more Brittany Griners in the United States of America. I'm sorry, we have the largest prison population in the world. Uh, What's going on with Brittany is horrible. Right. Don't get me long. It's horrible. And it's political pretext to have her in jail for that long for this for what she has been accused of doing. However, I'm not going to sit here in the country with the largest mass incarceration problem in the world where all of the people who look like me are the ones that are disproportionately uh, targeted by it and say that I should be somehow afraid of what would be happening if I lived in Russia. You can do both. You can argue for social justice and for income in, in, in equities. And you can argue that we have to be combating climate change and pandemics and we have to reimagine our national security, which I believe we have to do. You can say that those wars of the last 20 years were wrong, that we shouldn't be spending $870 billion a year on uh, on defense, which is an obscene amount of money, that Joe Biden made a terrible stake, mistake with the nuclear posture review he issued today, which commits us to spending about a trillion dollars every decade on nuclear weapons we don't need. You can argue all those things and you'd be absolutely right about that. And if we change those policies, we'd be a stronger, better country and still oppose fascism in the world yeah. and still say we have to come to the aid of those people. We can't let them be under under the control of this country. It's right. It's just. And in so doing, we may help ourselves. You know, I think that there are uh, where you were talking before about a blank check. And I yeah. think there are people who are, we, we, we do not have we're not giving Ukraine a blank check. But but we're, we're pretty close to it. You know, we're giving yeah, them a I, lot of money. There have been we're, we're, statements made, Joe. That's but, the issue. But there's, right, there's lots of good. And I agree with it. There are some people where what they want is for Putin to be humiliated, for him to be defeated. Right. Should we, so we'll be searching for an off ramp for Putin. No, screw him. Is Putin looking for an off ramp? No, he's not. He still thinks he's going to win. But that you cannot allow those that anger, that sentiment to prevail, because in the end, Russia remains a very strong country with 6,000 nuclear weapons. Putin has a firm control, whatever fissures are developing now. And in the end, you're going to have to negotiate a deal with him. The problem is that that's not now. And that's one of the other flaws in this letter. So let's says, talk about that. It says the, immediate, the goal should be an immediate end of the conflict. Well, you want an immediate end to the conflict, you're going to have to defeat Putin on the battlefield because he's not going to be willing to quit until he's clearly losing. And at that point, you're going to have to have negotiations. It's, it's a good, delicate operation. You're going to have to show him that he cannot win. And yes, here's the way out. Here's a way for you to retreat and stay in power. And that's where things like sanctions, relief and guarantees come, but not not now. He's not ready. He won't what, do it. Where, where in the letter does it say the word immediate end to the conflict? 
A rapid end to the conflict, and we iterate this goal okay. as America's chief priority. The last phrase. All right. Letter, a, so a a, a, I would say a rapid end is not the same thing as an immediate end, and the, and the language matters. And I accept that there, obviously, the letter is out of date in some ways. I, I understand that there are a number of recesses that could have affected the timing of this letter, et cetera. But in terms of that language, I don't, I don't see an issue with that because, because here's here's the here's the framing, well, Joe. Let me let me ask you about this. Sure. The problem is that it seems like if you suggest the war should end, if you suggest it should that the a negotiation, the nature of a settlement is that both sides are going to feel like they've lost a little bit of something. Mm -hmm. You are accused immediately of wanting to clear a path for Putin, help out Putin. Anything that benefits Putin in any way is characterized as somehow a desire to snuggle up with him and read him bedtime stories. When the nature of settlements and negotiation yeah. is that this is what we always say in the law. Yeah. If it's a good negotiation, both sides feel screwed. Now, <laughs> now, now nothing, nothing in this letter, again, says anything about specifically drawing down aid or anything like that at all, much less on a timeline that's based on anything other than what's in the best interest of Ukrainians or what they want. But there doesn't seem to me to be any space between the idea of a blank check and the idea of conditions. Yeah, It's one or the other, and people have very rabid responses one way or the other. Obviously, if you give someone money, there are conditions on the money. That's just life. That's why you don't borrow things from right. family. <laughs> right. That's why you don't go into business with your lover. That's why you don't do stuff like that. Yes. So here we are. The options I'm I me personally, you've heard what I said about how I don't I'm not sure that we should be involved in the least. But that's not the position of this letter. This letter says, let's get involved. We're involved. I support you, Joe Biden. Frankly, this letter is a bunch of butt kissing to the Biden administration, as far as I'm concerned, and almost doesn't say anything at all. It's the objection to the letter, frankly, that's made more of a stink about the idea of Democrats being somehow in league or these progressives being somehow in league with the right than anything else. If they had just let sleeping dogs lie, it's a whole nut. It's a nothing burger. In fact, several someone, some prominent commentator literally described it as such a nothing burger. So how would you characterize an appropriate, you, you're saying that this isn't the Democratic Party's repudiation of a peace movement. Right. Okay. So what is the version of this letter? What is the version of a statement that says, we are not giving you a blank check and that you need to be actively working for peace in a way that, frankly, our own administration, Biden administration, Blinken, uh, uh, Lloyd Austin, haven't been doing. Tony Blair, uh, sorry, LOL, sorry, not Tony Blair. Um with the hair, <laughs> the old PM, uh, Brexit. Okay. Oh, oh, sorry, what's Johnson, name? Johnson. Sorry, Boris Johnson, the way that okay. Boris Johnson Here's has my, been you interfering got the yes, to derail you got the, negotiations. Uh, well, I'll yeah, tell you what ahead. my version is, because I actually started looking at this. And well, what 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 would have made more sense? And would they just say, you know, if I told, I wrote an article and I said, look, could they just start with pursue, you know, diplomatic avenues? That would have been fine, which is kind of what a lot of us want. And we recognize that the Biden administration has not been balancing. Right. It's, they do need more balance. I, I'm, I've told them this privately, as have others. Uh, this was a rather heavy hand. But you could go to that last paragraph and it could say this. In conclusion, we urge you to make vigorous diplomatic efforts to end Russia's invasion of Ukraine and secure the territorial integrity of a Ukraine free from the threat of future assaults, period. You could say that. That's what we want you to do. And then you don't have to go into all this weirdness about a new terror, new security state. And you notice that the phrase they use is a sovereign and independent Ukraine. Well, what Ukraine wants is its, its borders back. It wants to have its territorial integrity. And that is something that this letter leaves out. But you could say that and still be fine. You could still be pursuing diplomatic options. There's lots of ways to do this. And I'm telling you, people are. There were lots of people in this town pushing for diplomacy with Ukraine, trying to develop diplomatic paths, looking ahead to off ramps in, in the spring, when there's, I think, a likely time when this war will be cleared. And in order to get there, you've got to support Ukraine all the way now to help them keep winning because they are winning this war. So Hershon, Hershon is going to be liberated in the next few weeks. The, the Russian army is in so, disarray. So this people, is the way 
okay, I just, you're the host. Okay. Go ahead, interrupt well, me. Pe- people have made that argument and yeah. said, well, that's why the timing of this letter is actually good. Yes. You want them to come to a negotiation table at the at a time when Ukraine is strong. So what's all of the brouhaha about it not coming out months ago? So when this letter was written, so in May and June, and uh, uh, the war did seem to be stalemated. Russia had made all its advances. That's when it had, as the letter said, recently captured a bunch of cities. But that's not what the case is now. Many of those cities have been recaptured by Ukraine, liberated. The Russian army is in retreat. The, the, the war is clearly failing. His, Putin was forced to do a mobilization that has exposed deep un- discontent in the Russian population. His, his ultra-nationalist base is, is furious at the conduct of the war. Russia is losing, and they're going to continue to lose. There are some experts, and we're just speculating on this, uh, well, the UK intelligence uh, head said that the Russian army is overextended and exhausted. We would keep getting reports of how fragile the Russian army is. So that's why, I mean, just from a, just a military point of view, if you're a Ukrainian, if you, you do not want to cease fire now, right now because you have the chance to really move the battle line way back ceasefire? to the border. Well, it's the, well, the letter does. Well, no. In a ceasefire. Mm, where does the letter call for a ceasefire? Okay, now you're going to watch me to look, look at the letter again. I, I... Given the destruction, blah, 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 we believe it's in the interest of Ukraine, the United States, and the world to avoid a prolonged conflict. For this reason, we urge you to pair the military and economic support the United States has provided to Ukraine with a pro- proactive diplomatic push, redoubling efforts to seek a, reali- a realistic framework for a ceasefire. There, That's just okay. the end of the war. Like, we, we want you to come to the end of the war at some point. Yes, but you see... That, I, mean, I don't see that as a call for any, see, any immediate, in your words, ceasefire. Okay. I, but you see, from, from a military point of view, the Ukrainians, and they're right about this, they don't want to cease fire now. They're winning. They don't well, want they don't to, have to. They don't have Who's to making, who, who is making them come to a ceasefire? Well, that's one of the points of the letter is they want the U.S. to negotiate a ceasefire. Well, eventually. Doesn't everybody want there to be a ceasefire? Doesn't well, everybody uh, want there to be at the end of the war? Yes, but then you go to the end of the letter and it says this is the, this is the primary aim of U.S. policy should be to end this war. It should it not be? Well, the way they want to end it is they want to end it in place. And what, what, if you did what this letter says, you would leave Russia uh, occupying millions of Ukrainian people. So here's, here's the fundamental question. Right now. Here's the fundamental question. And if you wait, you might be able to free those people and get a ceasefire with a, a territorially intact Ukraine. Then, then, they, can, then they can wait. But pri- this letter doesn't say anything about whether they should ceasefire now or six months right. from now. So here, let's, it's all best that this though. letter failed. And let's start all over again. Well, no, Let's it's, start it's, a new diplomatic it's, effort. It's not the best because right now, the majority of Americans, even before this letter, 57% of Americans supported uh, appro- approved negotiation to the end of the war, even if it means some compromise with Russia. 59 agree, 59 percent agree that the U.S. has a leading role to play in such negotiations. That's not me speaking. That's the American public. That's none of my business. However, the question I have for you is, do you think that America should commit to funding this war, no matter what it takes, until Ukraine's the, the borders that Ukraine started with at, in February and or including Crimea, are returned to Ukrainian control. Is well, that is that the level? I, you I do. do. I think I, Ukraine I think has that's... a Ukraine has a right to free its people. Well, if you all, you got to see the conditions they're living under are horrendous, and I know Joe, there are terrible conditions all around the world. But we're talking about Ukraine. You want to talk about Haiti? I think we should intervene but in Ukraine Haiti. Ukraine has a right. I don't think we should intervene in Haiti. But I, I don't think Ukraine has a right is the same thing as America must commit to fund. You don't get a right. I have a right. This is what Republicans say to me all the time. No, I, no that's what I mean. Healthcare Ukraine, is a human I, I understand. right. Education no, it's is not a the human same. right. Okay. I, I understand. So what? I'm not going to fund it is what Republicans say. So I want to understand. I, I do believe that there are these moments, these moral obligations the country has. We don't have to belabor that point. All I'm saying is I think that some people are going to disagree with the notion, especially if you pull Crimea into the mix, that America basically owes Ukraine a blank check until it is able to maintain, the, to get back to its pre-2012 Can, can I borders. ask you, have you talked yeah. to any Ukrainians about this? Yes. Okay, and what do they say? It's a mixed bag. Uh-huh. It depends on which Ukrainians you talk to, as evidenced by some of the polling um, that happened around the time of the what, what should have been the Minsk Accords. And that was part of why they didn't want to have a vote. Like Part of the issue was there was supposed to be a vote on what happened to those eastern regions. And people who were afraid of what that vote might 
tell us about where that who to whom that region was going to belong didn't want to go down that negotiated path for that very reason. Mm. Now, some people think that the vote the election wasn't going to be equitable and that it was rigged and Putin was involved and the polls aren't real and you can't trust what the Russians are saying. But I don't know. This is why Elon Musk has now gotten in trouble because he's basically said this, that there should be that the, the people in disputed territory should get to vote and democratically decide what where they want to belong. OK, I understand there's obvious, obvious problems with actually enforcing something like that diplomatically. But in absence of that, it's hard to it's hard to see what is a more democratic, a, a more equitable solution than letting people have self-determination. I understand that there's counter arguments to that. I'm not right. really want, trying to die on that hill. That's that. I'm just trying to steal me on that view. But before we run out of time, I do want to I want, do want to ask about this central issue. And that's about ceding territory to, re, to Republicans. Armand, can we play that Tulsi Gabbard clip? <laughs> Tulsi Gabbard? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. These so-called progressives did a very simple thing that apparently uh, can appear to be brave in Washington these days. In that letter to President Biden, they just told the truth about how this ongoing proxy war with Russia is increasing in cost and consequences, both on the Ukrainian people, but also the American people here at home and how it's negatively impacting gas prices, increasing inflation and so on. Uh, you know, the, these progressives in the letter, they didn't say stop sending aid to Ukraine now. All they said was, hey, President Biden engage in diplomacy uh, and the response they got, of course, from the warmongers who control the Democrat Party in Washington was to immediately be smashed to pieces so much so that these Democrat members of Congress cowered in the corner with fear and now have gone so far out of their way, apologizing profusely for having the audacity to call for diplomacy in this war that's putting us all at risk. And now they're, they've actually gone 180 degrees in the opposite direction. They're now trying to prove how much of a, a warmongers they too are by saying, no, don't engage in diplomacy. We don't want you to do that. Uh, th this is exactly, Tucker, one of the main reasons I left the Democrat Party. They are completely controlled by these warmongers in Washington. They don't really care about the Ukrainian people. Otherwise, they would have engaged in of diplomacy course. many, many months ago. They don't really care about the American people who are struggling uh, just, to, just to make ends meet, struggling with inflation, struggling with increasing costs of just about everything and it just shows who they are subservient to the military industrial complex and the war hawks in the democrat party and the mainstream media all right joe how should democrats counter that so what before i get to you she's doing an interview with tucker carlson and you agree with what she's saying how would you how would you have democrats counter that tulsi gabbard well uh when I was at the Quincy Institute and this kind of line that's reflected in the letter was being developed, I really argued against it. I said this was a disastrous line um, to try what to- What line is that? That, the U that the, basically that the U.S. was responsible for causing the war and that we well, had to end Well, that's not what Tulsi- the, No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm talking about just put my conversations in, in Quincy, not in the letter. The letter doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. And but I know that I know a lot of people who are supporting the letter and Brendan Schoen about they they do believe that the U.S. caused the war, and that we had to end it. This was a distraction from our other um, issues, and the and since Ukraine was wouldn't do that on its own, we had to basically force them, pressure them to do it in one way or the other. And one of those ways is to have direct talks with Russia and, and end it. I said this was a disaster, that this was going to do great harm to the institute that I believed in at the time and to the cause of restraint, which I believed in, that we should put diplomacy first and we should be pulling back our military commitments, reducing the military budget. And in fact, now that you've seen an, an instance of this, uh, an effort to, to, to put this out as a, a, at least the position of some Democrats in the party, that's exactly what's happened. It's blown up in their face. This is a terrible position and it's doing great damage. It's exactly what I warned about. And it allows people like Tulsi Gabbard to go on Tucker Carlson and say, see, the Democratic Party is a party of warmongers. You can't even talk about diplomacy. And unfortunately, I think you're kind of feeding into that because you're accepting that frame. You think that this small group, this particular proposal represents diplomacy. And if you're against this particular proposal, you're against diplomacy. No, I am for diplomacy. What, what I other, am against dumb diplomacy. What other pro-diplomacy pr policy or platform letter statement has been issued by the Democratic Party to counter, to accommodate ah. To accommodate the interest of 57 percent of America, to reflect the interest of 57 percent of Americans who believe that peace is the answer. Good point. 
And that's exactly what I've been talking to people about. You, you, the, the administration has got to talk more about their diplomatic efforts to bring this uh, conflict to an end. And they haven't been. And no, they haven't was, been. What they did right. was quash the right. one small effort to open the door to that conversation more violently, more aggressively than I've seen them respond I, I to repeat, the Republican attack on Social Security I, I or Medicare. I don't the think voting it's fair to characterize issues, it that way. The I, police no, went, issues. There was, what you just said is simply not true. The Biden administration did not squash it. So I'm telling you, the members themselves who signed it pulled it back. What do you think just happened? What did you see? You just saw it. Look at how many statements there are from the people who signed it. This was a disaster. Disaster. If they a disaster. believe this was a staff led operation with very little oversight Joe, that went way too far and it embarrassed the members and they pulled it back. Do, do you have any evidence that the administration had any he, role in pulling thing. back that letter? It, well, I'm sorry. When I see someone like Matt, Dutton I know you're making an the way that he has done. No, I can tell you. Don't for, act, I, look, look, I know Matt. Did, I, I, bring I, I, him I, on the I, show. I that is to, absolutely I, I think, not. I would happy be happy to have him back. He's been on. He can come on again. But the problem is this. If you really believed, like I do and have been arguing for weeks, that Democrats are setting Tulsi up to make that exact argument. Okay. I can't be mad at Tulsi. Tulsi didn't say a single untrue thing <gasps> there. Are I'm you sorry. kidding me? It's one lie after the other. What are name, you talking about? Name a lie. Warmongers. Which? Warmongers. The Democratic Party is controlled Wait, by sorry. warmongers? We're leftists. We obviously know and believe that the Democratic Party is controlled by warmongers. We, the, the, the deep state knows no D or our or, or, or party affiliation. Wait, th th this, this, is, this is like she not even, even a controversial the, statement. She even lies the about the name of the party. The whole point why we loved Bernie Sanders. She, she calls it the Democrat I, I Party. I don't care. I'm not well, a Democrat. It's an insult. I don't care. That I am. Pe I do pe care. People are people are dying, Joe. People can't afford to put gas in their car. They don't care if you call it Democratic Party or the Democrat Party. Nothing that she said was untrue. Oh the, rea God. the reality is, tell me what sentence that she said, <sighs> Joe, was untrue. With the, the Democratic Party has set the Republicans up because they have 10 people in their entire party who are willing to say, I don't think that we should have unconditional support for Ukraine. Again, not we should end support tomorrow or I don't care about Ukrainians and they can go kick rocks. But there, sh there shouldn't be unconditional financial mm. aid going to a country when our own country is in a crisis. J because they're the only ones in the entire political sphere who are willing to make that statement. They have opened up the door for all of the people who put pieces of priority, all of the anti-interventionists who I got to say, a lot of them went from Bernie to Trump. Given them a home over there. Meanwhile, the tiniest cracked door to being able to say, hey, there's some of us on the left that care about peace too, was squashed by the Democratic Party. And instead of saying, hey, there were some errors with that letter, here's our actual united commitment to a peace movement and ending the war in Ukraine from the left, they said, if you say anything about ending the war before exactly when Vladimir P P uh, I hear Zelensky you. I hear you. Okay, with his me... movie star yeah. airs and performativity, I'm sorry, until Vladimir Zelensky personally decides the war should be over, it's a blank check to Ukraine. People won't stand for that. People aren't standing for it. And people are going to the Republican Party as a consequence. Isn't that a problem? I think Zelensky is one of the greatest uh, leaders we've seen in a very long time. He has really risen to the challenge here and united his country. And this new, new Ukraine is being forged in this war, similar to, to what happened in the American Revolution, where it, with all its problems. Ukraine's got a lot of problems. It's got a lot of corruptions. It does have right wing forces in it. It's got lots of problems, but it is getting better as a result of, of, what, of what's happening and in large part because of Zelensky's leadership. But here's the point and here's where we end it. I will promise you that after this election, you will see a more sophisticated, developed, realistic, it's diplomatic. What? After oh, the election is too late? I mean, Kevin are, McCarthy's going to be setting the agenda by that time. So we'll, that, that we have the option to do our version of this, but now it's going to be Kevin McCarthy saying, well, we're going to withdraw aid from Ukraine. God, listen, I, I really appreciate coming on your show because it makes me realize how stupid this freaking letter was, what damage it did. This, these this people letter were just didn't idiots. do it. it this, letter did. Made, this letter made this letter made obvious. It. It was, we have been, Joe, if they did it right, it wouldn't have been a success. If they did it right, we'd be, all be, we'd be they, having a whole different conversation. They could have followed up this letter with a double down version that was better and cured any ailments okay. you see with the letter. They didn't. They withdrew yeah. the letter. And they have offered nothing in its stead. And they have created this vacuum, a vacuum that existed a long time before the letter, a vacuum which Robbie and I have been talking about on the Hill for a long time, a vacuum which 57% okay. of Americans in that poll know to exist, and which, I'm sorry, is going to be, if okay. Democrats lose the House and Senate, as 
may very well happen, is this is going to have contributed to not the letter, but the conditions that caused the letter to be written. And I believe that, uh, I would say by the end of the year, probably, you will see a much more substantial diplomatic effort being mounted by the United States. So a lot of the things that you want, that some of the original signers of the letter, not the people, not the staff and the experts who wrote it, but the signers of the letter wanted, I believe you're going to get that, that that is in process and you'll well, see it. I'll come I, back and we'll talk about it well, then. Well, I hope you do. Look, I really do appreciate you coming on this. I, I've had a couple of conversations recently with people who feel differently about Ukraine with me. And I, I'm really grateful for them because unfortunately, a lot of people who are much more expert on this than I, you know, no one wants to talk to them. Um, you know, Aaron Mate was just canceled and Aaron Mate and I think also Chomsky was on the lineup. I'm not sure if both of them were canceled or just one, but I saw both of them getting criticism for being participants in this European conference. They both just uh, got- Max, It was Max Blumenthal. These people are Putin. These, this guy is really in the pay of Putin. I, I mean, Max I, Blumenthal's I a dis- nut. I disagree. No, I dis- Max Blumenthal? Really? I, I, I strongly, I very much Gray value- zone? That whole I thing? very much value the contributions of Gray Zone to this conversation and Aaron Mate. Wow. And I wish that people- who disagree with them would engage with them directly instead of feeling like I have to be a proxy for these different wings of the party to try to understand what the truth of a situation well, is. Well, he's been How- attacking me ruthlessly as an imperialist warmonger and that I support, support Nazi militias in Ukraine. Well, I, I'd exactly be happy a to guy broker- you want to talk to. No, I don't well, have no interest well, in Well, here's where we are. This is, this is why this ends up no, happening. Man, I think that if people were willing to talk to each other, we yeah. wouldn't have these faction after faction after faction emerging on the left. But I do appreciate your willingness okay. to sit down with me. I hope I haven't burned too many bridges such that you won't, aren't no. willing to do it again going but, forward. Well, I really appreciate having a more fleshed out version of what the perspective is of the, the other side, as it were. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me on and letting me have this exchange with you. It's always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure. Do you want to tell our audience where they can find you on the internet and more broadly? You can find me at at Serencioni on Twitter. I've just published an article in Defense One. I just did an interview with Steve Clemens for his new uh, publication, Semaphore, but that's where I am. I'm not affiliated with any organization. Nobody pays me. I am a com- I am an independent American voice. Yes. Well, and if you want to continue to support this independent American show, minority-owned, female-owned business over here at Bad Faith Podcast, <laughs> you can subscribe for five dollars a month at Patreon.com/slash Bad Faith Podcast and get an extra episode of Bad Faith Podcast every week on a Monday. That's four extra episodes in addition to the four Thursday episodes every month. And you also get full video episodes as well. Thank you so much for joining this um, really animated, I think, enriched conversation. Take care of yourselves. And as always, keep the